competition hunting. It is fun. It is fun and it's, it just keeps uh, it's even further if you get more involved in it. But these are kind of like hints and ideas here to get you prepared for competition hunting. So basically, it's just, it's just, just a basic, easy, simple task to know what you can know, things that you need to know about the competition hunting. So, so I've done it a lot, and the more I've gotten into it, the more I got used to it, and the more I've gotten into involved in the competition hunting, <coughs> and I've gotten to uh, finding more tokens and more prizes to us. You know. so, so basically these are my hints of what you can uh, prepare yourself for competition hunting. To register before the deadline to avoid late fees. It helps to avoid uh, paying late fees if you get there the day of or miss the deadline. You know. So it, and you also get you probably if they have them, you can probably get yourself it, they'll probably have yourself if they do have it in early drawings for when you register early. Uh, prepare a to-go list prior to going to your hunt so you are so you aren't trying to hurry and get out the door. I've noticed that maybe sometimes people would rush to get out the door and don't know exactly if exactly you got everything or not. You know? So always prepare yourself when you have everything ready to go. You know, <coughs> check all your stuff and it'll be right there and set it by the door and you're ready to go. Uh, make sure you know where the hunt will take place. If you can drive there, get there early to make sure that you know where you're going. You know, I've gotten, I have gotten several calls of people knowing and said, where is this competition hunt and gone at? It's supposed to be at a park. You know, you tell them, well, it's at this park. Casino Beach, take for an example, is that, well, where is Casino Beach? You know, follow your instructions they give you on the, on the brochure when you fill out your entry form. Keep that that in handy and even on your uh, on your phone as where the map is at that will also that will also help so always keep the map out and know exactly where, you know, where the competition hunt is being taking place regardless it's either at a park or at a beach so, uh, be aware of the weather conditions and forecast in the area you know, and it happens someday you have much, uh, bright sunny days it's hot and then some days I've been, been through it that have been really rough weather. It rained, so be prepared yourself to know where the weather is at. You know, so we've gotten close, we've gotten, you know, even tornado warnings, tornado watches at competition hub. So other than that, you know, you know where to look, you know, you need to look have to be aware of the weather. You know. uh, bring an extra protector if you have one in case. You know, and it's always good. Everybody is a, you know, it's always a nice that they can bring an extra detector with them. Um, find out what tokens and targets are made of. Tokens are usually made out of either out of dimes with a number placed on it, and sometimes they're made out of pennies painted on it, you know, with a number, and sometimes there are different types of tokens, you know. So it's always good to know exactly that the comp master will tell you what you're looking for, what kind of a token target are you looking for. Uh, find out how the hunt master hit the targets, scattered or buried. The reason is, is that he might bury an inch or an inch and a half on the ground, or he might just drop it and kick the dirt over it. You know? So obviously, you know, if you're hunting for something that you get a deep signal, it's probably it's not no, it's not a target that's part of the competition hunt and maybe something there it's very deep that's been left there a long time ago. You know, so it's not part of the competition hunt. I've gotten a lot of signals like that, you know, and if the hunt master will tell you, you know, there may be something maybe in the industry, But they'll tell you exactly that they're just gonna drop on the grass or just kick the leaves over it, just kick the sand or the dirt over it. You know, it makes it a lot easier for everybody to uh, find your targets. Um, put fresh batteries in your detector before starting the hunt. Always do that. The reason is because halfway 
through the competition on it. Your battery may get halfway um, dying, and it may you may have a lot of trouble picking up those signals. No. So I always put new batteries in the no uh, detector. Uh, make sure your pouch is easy to get get to get the fines into. A lot of people will use these green things that they put on their legs. I have a pouch that has that's really easy for me to just drop there, drop whatever I find real quick and easy. A lot of people will be wearing aprons, but I know it's because a lot of people wear these uh, screen things over their legs because it makes it so easy when they find the target. What we do is just pick it up and drop it in, you know, put it in their basket. So, uh, pay attention and ready at the signal to go. It happens a lot. Uh, the hunt master says whenever you get get to a position where you're about ready to start the hunt, he'll tell you it's a ready detector. He'll mount the signal. But sometimes I notice that a lot of people uh, may lose track of time, you know, to get to where you know get to the hunt because it probably there may be more when more than one hunt area it may be located on the opposite side of the park. You know. uh, keep moving. It's always good to keep moving, and I'll tell you my. Uh, my hint for this is that when I pick up a target and all of a sudden I pick up another target while I'm still, I set my foot on it in front of it. So I'm digging one target up, I know my other target's right there. You know? So, but it also will you know, keep moving where you know because you always find there will be more targets spread around. Uh, sweet flat. I've seen a lot of this happen. I always swing my detector going left and right and going to wide position. I've seen a lot of this good going in an angle up and down, you know, and they're tend to miss targets. So, and I've seen it happen. So, that's always you. It's always a good idea to keep your detector flat. A lot of people will do it, but I have seen a, a lot of people just going like this. Uh, don't think target is not included in the hunt, which means a deep signal, you're going to have a trash signal. You're going to have an iron signal. You know, there may be a coin that's buried deep, you know, that's been in there for a long time, you know. So probably, like I mentioned before, your target's <coughs> there for the hunt competition. It's going to be very shallow, you know, very close to the surface. Uh, don't stop to look at targets as you dig. I always do is when I find a target, pick it up, put it in there, keep moving. Find a target, pick it up, keep moving. You know? So if you need to just look at it for a second, I just drop it in my pouch. You know? uh, if you get an error friends from other machines, move away from the machine, or if you can change your frequency. You know? A lot of people will have the same frequencies like I, you know that everybody has a the same unit, the same detector, and I've seen a lot of 250s. You know, it's a good detector, but sometimes when you're in the same frequency, you gotta have a lot of interference going around with some other people, you know. So, um, have a backup machine when you're ready to go in case of machine failure, failure or too much interference. I always have a backup machine myself, and it happened to me before. Uh, I use a bounty hunter, and since I, because I used it a lot, the arm brace broke off. So I have my 250 ready to go, you know, with fresh batteries in case of that ever happened. So it may happen, but to me it has happened, so I was lucky to have my backup machines ready to go at that time. Uh, sort through your funds, looking for tokens, and be ready when the prizes are awarded. And the hunt master will be calling for numbers out when they get ready to pass a, uh, to hand out the prizes. And they keep yelling for the numbers if you have one. Or you're over here, you're still counting, you're still looking at your fines. You know, kind of get closer to the hunt master so that way you'll be, you'll be able to hear him. He'll, he'll be able to call out your number or whatever token you might, or you might have. Because that will be close.
plus knows the other way you don't have to be keep calling out your name, you keep calling out your number. So, but I guess I've seen, seen that happen before. Um, have you planned for lunch before you break so you don't have to use a lot of time? So take food. They'll, also, well, they have, they'll have a food at the one we went to the Casino Beach for a cow town. You know, they had lunch out there that we just paid about five dollars out of it. You know, uh, we went to a competition up in uh, Galveston. There was a Subway sandwich right across the street, so it made a real, it made it real easy for us, convenient there to just get a sandwich and be ready to go when they're ready to have the next time. You know, after the lunch break, uh, stay until the end. Stay until the end because sometimes if all tokens are not found, the Hummester will drop the price. <coughs> so there have uh, there have been prizes tokens that like they have not been found. So and they will draw for for those names by using your your uh, name tag. So they will do drawings in case of those you know, those tokens have not been able to been just, uh, been found. So but basically this is what. Uh, my hands and ideas for, for a hunting competition in. It is fun, and sometimes there'll be a lot of people, and sometimes there will be not as many as they thought they'll have in the competition, but it is like it is fun. It is fun for the, for the kids as well, too. So, so, like I said, I've done it a lot, and basically a lot of practice that I've done, I have gotten more. Uh, more experience to it, you know, and finding more targets myself. So, uh, and I also have a checklist if anybody, if anybody wants to uh, have one, it's on how to be successful in competition hunt. It's basically a checklist that can provide you for anything for you to get, for you to get ready for a competition hunt. So basically, those are my ideas, and they're fun. You know, going to wherever they have, there's always be places where, you know, before getting there, having dinner, or going to a museum. So, but these, uh, like I said, these competition hunts are, are a lot of fun at it. That is my. What's on the checklist? Huh? What's on oh, the checklist? What's on the checklist? It said, on how to be a success, how to be success at a competition. Uh, my uh, to go with this is a uh, checklist as well as with detectors, batteries, gloves, Ziploc bags, uh, gloves in case if you want to use them in the park areas or wherever it's the beach sandy areas. And I'm going to use it myself to wear. I don't need to wear gloves. And it happened to me that. In one of the competition hunts we had at uh, at, at our convention, when they did the uh, dog hunt, well, in the park where there was there was a dog poo out there, so it, it almost got in my, it almost got in my fingers. I don't know who else might have got into it. It was always a good idea to have gloves. I use rubber gloves myself. In the dog park. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great place to hide coins. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently they probably didn't need no it, know it either. <laughs> they call back to put all your stuff, put all your windows in. <laughs> so, uh, sunscreen, where you're out the uh, sun. Well, I was hiding you know, coins, put them in fire and have mounds. Fire yeah. and mounds. Uh, bug spray is always a good idea because you know, in the parks area, there is a lot of mosquitoes when they have the competition in during the summer. Uh, wear a hat, headphones, headphone adapters that always helps. Uh, your pouch to kill, drop all your coin, all your fines in when you come to competition on. Uh, towel, paper towels, uh, a rain poncho is always a good idea when you know, be prepared because when it rains and the weather is bad weather, you always be ready for it. Uh, bottle water, snacks, a chair. Uh, plan for weather, either hot or cold, appropriate clothing, a shower cap to cover your 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 detector. You no, know, regardless if you're in at the 
park where the weather is going to be bad, it's going to be rainy, or you're at the beach when you know where the salt water air is going to get to your component. So that is my uh, that is my checklist. Thank you. The main is only one hunt. It is a silver dime hunt, and there are a lot of pro a lot of tokens for prizes. And when they get done with this, uh, with the hunt, they'll have you said to hold on to your tokens, and they'll do the award inside the building. You know, mostly probably because um, it, they'll get everything so that way they can get everything prepared. You know. I just wondered what the prize is. Did they they have split the pot. Yeah. <laughs> They are up like from metal detectors to silver dollars. Um, I got a um, I got a five dollar gold piece from uh, one of the one of the one of the tokens, or also they one of the drawings that they have, and they also have everything else like um, um, carry on bags and. Um, Shirts, hats, pin pointers, pro pointers, um, ding set, ding tool sets with the uh, with pouch. So those are real good prices. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are, sometimes if they if they have it, a a year subscription to Lost Raiders magazine. So. What kind of uh, entry fees do they want to charge for this competition? The entry fee that I. The one coming up for this convention, I think it was a uh, hundred dollars. Oh. Oh, I thought it was one hundred dollars to three hundred, depending on how, what, how much there is in the ground. Yeah. And the silver being at the price it is, at a hundred dollars, you don't get near what you're going to get at one hundred fifty, two hundred, or three hundred dollars hmm. in the ground. So, they will put all their money into the hunt. Yeah. Everything, that, as far as all of the entry fees go into prizes and, and coins in the ground. So they make their money on fundraisers or raffles, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And they make good money on it. Sounds like my privilege. Go. So you'll see two or three times silver dimes. The majority of this silver hunt is coming up in the competition. The other competition I've been involved with for the ones on the beach and the ones for the hearts uh, from other clubs that they put on. Uh, the hunt fees are, are raised in different in different ranges. There and I work my uh -huh off, and I come back five or six coins. And I was a you know not a very good loser like that. So and so I was fussing, and my wife said, "What do you expect? You're doing everything wrong." And I said, "What?" And she says, "You're doing everything wrong." This was at a Houston hunt. They had eight hunts. Okay. So the second hunt, she says, why don't you do this? Okay, so I tried this. Come back, I got about 12 coins. Man, I mean, I'm going. She says, now change this and this. And the time I got to the last one, I was in the top three. Yeah. So you listen to your wife or in your case, if you had a husband or whatever. Yes. What were you doing wrong? Everything. <laughs> well, tell us. Okay, first place, I was taking it, cleaning it off, looking at it. And, and then put it in the pocket. There you go. I also would set my detector down and get my digger out, dig it, pick it up, look at it, put the digger back in, go over, pick up the detector. And eventually you learn, you dig one hand, you swing with the other, and you never kneel unless you just cannot bend over. Because every second or fraction of a second may cost you a coin. You got it. And you want to be fast, and you don't, Everybody has to learn their own detector, but you don't want to overswing. The detectors, the best detectors for competition hunting are single tone. No display, single tone. And if you think about it, it's kind of like driving down a highway. If you got one road with no offshoots and no flashing signs, it's going to be faster and easier to get where you're going. Now, if you start putting in tones, yeah. that's kind of like roads on the side, you got to figure out which road to take because you can't go straight. The thing dies and you got four ways to go. So it's got to decide where to go. And if you got a display, it's like, okay, here, 
Now, you know, here's this big billboard in front of you. You, you got to read it to see what you're doing. So everything in the computer chip takes time. You don't want to take any time. You want a single tone, no display detector for competition hunting. Well, you, That's, some of them you can turn off. Pardon? Some of them you can turn them off, can't you? Well, now, depending on which ones you're talking about, some of them still go through the process, even if you turn off. Even if you turn it off and use the single tone? It still goes through the process. It just doesn't display it. And that. But, you know, now that's not the machine most people want to do regular hunting with. So that automatically says you need two machines, one for normal hunting and one for competition. Can you sell the competition machine? <laughs> I can. <laughs> I can sell the others too. Matter of fact, right now, probably believe the best competition machine in the last six months to a year is the Technetic Eurotech. It's real lightweight, about two pounds, sturdy, and it's single tone, nothing on it, but you turn on and go. And as Daniel mentioned, if you're looking for dimes, have the discrimination, especially on a single tone one, up past pull tabs and that, so you don't pick those up here. Put it up so that you're finding what you're looking for. If you're not looking for nickels, don't put nickels in. I don't care if you got a, if you got a notch machine, notch them out. That's what he's saying, basically, is you know what you're looking for and look for such a detector to find what you're looking for. And as he was saying earlier on the bags and stuff, you want a bag that basically is open so that you can just drop your hand in it. You don't want a, like a carpenter's apron with a nail bag that's tight. you got to sit there and fumble because you're losing time. You want everything as fast and as quick as you can get it. I, I don't care, you know, if you're 100 or if you're 30. You know, you want it to do it as fast as you can do it. And that's not going to be the same speed you know, as somebody younger. Fine. I always go back to the little old lady. She was 92 in San Antonio. I used to cry every time I seen her in a competition hunt. <laughs> because she would go out, she smoked cigarettes, she had a jacket on, she'd sit there and they'd say go, she'd have her cigarette smoking, she'd put it out, put it in her truck, go get her machine off the ground, pick it up, turn it on, get a signal, turn the machine off, dig it, look at it, put it in her pocket, pull her cigarette out, <laughs> Light it, smoke a couple of puffs, put it back out again, put it back in her pocket, go on. She never found over four or five coins. And only once did she only have one token for a metal detector. The rest of the time she either had tokens for two or three metal detectors. Even though she only had six total targets, she was lucky. So it doesn't have to be the quantity. And I have had 200 targets out of a hut with no tokens. <laughs> So it's not the quantity, it's the quality. You probably have them notched out. Pardon? You had them notched out. <laughs> no, they were a dime just like everything else. So you said the tokens are dimes also, or are they separate? Most of the time they're dimes, and most of the time they're clad. But there's very, they, very few. How do you know one dime from a token dime? Are they painted? They're yeah, they're, they're painted and stamped with a number. And they have a number oh. stamped on it. Okay. Then, Houston used to not paint theirs. They just would stamp them, and it was muddy. And I've gotten home with as many as five tokens in my bag because I couldn't find them in the mud. So now almost everybody paints them, which helps. You may have a heck of a time reading the number, but by George, if you got colored paint on it, you know you better look at it close. And as he said, water. Take you an extra bottle of water, a little bucket, put your tokens in there. Pour the water on there, slush them around, wash them good, tie them out, and you can read them. So, yeah, Joe. Some of the old hunts used to do all kinds of weird stuff. You know, I don't know if they still do it or not, but I know that uh, Truman used to say there was this one hunt that they said, we're in a trashy area, we want you to dig everything. And well, they had that's pretty well non-existent now. Okay. They used to, topics used to be, uh, the star bottle caps that you clamp, crimp on, used to be pull tabs, you would have horseshoe nail maybe, uh, axe head, yeah. you know, didn't care, they just put something, paint a number on it. And they don't do that much anymore. Last one that I know of was, was it three, four years ago at Cowtown. 
they had out there. They had all those crazy things. They had knives and forks with uh, numbers painted on them. I had a horse head that big, weighed about seven pounds, that had a number painted on it. So I'm tucking around seven pounds of iron out there, you know, on the hunt field. I mean, you know, most people don't do that anymore. It's, it's usually a clad dime or a penny. And one of the things I'll tell you, if they do pennies, be sure you pick up zinc. Because about half of the tokens will be on zinc pennies, not, not copper. So you want, don't want to, you figure out, if they say it's a penny, be sure you pick up zinc. Because they won't tell you. They say, oh no, they're all copper. And those people are just looking at the color and says, yeah, it looks copper to me, so it's copper. Will they usually tell you what the tokens are? What kind of coin? Uh, they'll tell you generally. Yeah. I, mean, and, I don't mean, they may say penny, but it doesn't mean copper versus zinc. They won't tell you copper versus zinc. But they'll tell you. And if they do, don't believe okay. them. Okay. It's, okay. A penny, it's a penny with a, uh, with a, with, with a painted uh, yellow or a painted red. Uh -huh. you know. yeah, they'll be painted. Okay. Even pennies are painted. But <clears throat> you don't believe them if they tell you they're all copper. Because I went to a hunt dead. I got seven tokens. One was copper, the other six were zinc. So, anyway. What, what size of coil is the best for doing that? Small coil? That's a, that's a good question. Well, uh, depends on you know, the size of the field and the number of targets, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. If you've got a relatively small field for 40, 50 people, whatever's hunting it, a small coil will work a little better. But if you've got a huge field, you probably want the standard coil, whatever came on it. I have never seen a reason to go above standard. But I'm sure they could, I probably, next time I go to, you'll probably have, you know, you'll have an area the size of this room, there'll be one token in every area the size of this room or something. You never know. I mean, it depends on the acreage in that, so. But generally, standard to small. And you don't want, what is it, the pinpointers? The little pinpointers, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Your small coil should be about five inch. I know some of them have threes and some have sixes and that. And some have four and a half and stuff. So you don't want to go any smaller for sure than three. Mm -hmm. Smaller coil will pick up the target and it'll center it. And it pinpoints it better, faster for you. Yeah. Now, there's one other secret, which I don't know. I have told Daniel, but I'll tell you all the same time he hears it, okay? Right. That if you're having trouble with interference, put your small coil on, turn it max sensitivity. So what it does, it sends out the exact same signal that a large coil, but it only picks up less because it's smaller. So what it does, it chases everybody else away, and you don't have to move. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. It's, it's a... It's an old trick. That Any pocket devices? Pardon? Any pocket devices <laughs> to interfere with other ones? <laughs> no. Nah. If you interfere with others, uh, old timers, they can pick out solid signals from interference. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking probably anybody has been doing it 20 years plus. The rest of them are very hard. You can pick out a solid signal among all the other garbage signals. And just go dig them and just keep on going like nobody ever knew the difference. And if you ever pull your headphones out, people will go, Oh, how can you find anything? But you can. Yeah. Once you get used to it. Know your detector. Know how fast you can swing it. Detectors are, the swing speed is real important. Uh, now, most of them you can swing average to uh, average fast. Some of them you can swing 90 to nothing. And usually the single tone fishers, the Tesoros are the best on that. But if you got multi tones, that slows you down a little. But you know, the other side of the story is how many people can swing like that for 30 minutes? You're going to give out anyway. So you're going to pick a speed that's good for you and good for your detector. Doing competition hunt, when I started doing competition in the parks, I did you go, always go with a, a, um, a standard coil. Uh, before the pin, the 
pro pointers come started coming out, you know, it made it a little difficult, but I had a pin pointer on my detector. Now when the pro pointers came out, you can use them. I use them in the parks, basically because it centers me on where the target is exactly that. Pick it up, drop it, go on. Find the target, pick it up, drop it, go on. So the standard quad does work for me and it helps improve my competition hunting. On beach hunting, competition hunting, I don't need the pro pointer. Basically, I'm using the standard no uh, sand scoop is normally is what I'm normally using because we know I know the target's right there. Scoop it up, shake it, put it in my mouth, okay, and just keep going. And because a lot of the targets are not very bad deep. 